Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for watching this video. It meant so much to go through your comments and I really enjoy it and being able to share my experiences with you. So thank you so much for taking the time to write comments and ask questions. I will continue to try and help and answer those questions as much as I can. Um, even if I don't have the answer myself, I might be able to redirect you to um, some websites or links that you can find out more information from. So today we'll be covering the false risk assessment form. So in Australia, falls is a very big thing. You know, falls, pressure injury, medication error can have significant impact on the patient's health outcome under our care. So there is a big focus and emphasis on falls reduction, falls prevention education to prevent falls in hospital or even at home. So what we're going to cover today is false risk assessment for inpatient setting. All right, let's get straight into the form. All right, guys, as you can see on the screen here, this is the falls injury risk assessment form. This form is a sample only, and I uh, obtained this form from the OSCE handbook, preparation handbook. There's a link there for this form, which I will leave in the description below. So this is the first page of the form, and it tells you when to use the falls and falls injury risk factor assessment form. So the first example is within eight hours of admission for all people aged 65 years and over and 50 years and over for Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people. And also if younger people are admitted as a result of falls or people who are known to have unsteady gaits or a history of recent falls. So when we talk about history of recent falls here in this section, it means that the patient has had one or more falls in the previous six months. Or also, like I said before, the patient have a condition or disability that is associated with increased risk of or injury from falls. So the second example is reassess following a fall, which means that if your patient has had a fall in the hospital under your care, you would use this form again to redo the false risk assessment. Another example is a change in their health status. A significant change in medication or environment because some medications are known to cause dizziness or lightheadedness so it's always important to take that into consideration if your patient has had a significant change in their medication recently or environment for example if your patient has a history of mild cognitive impairment or dementia a change in environment could contribute and increase the risk of fall significantly for those type of patients because they are used to their own surroundings. They know where things are, they know how to move around. But when it's a new environment, they're not familiar with it. Therefore, their risk of falls is greatly increased. And also prior to discharge. And use of this form is not required if EPAS or equivalent is available. What is EPAS? Enterprise Patient Administration System, which is an electronic medical record system that is used in South Australia, in Adelaide. So obviously, if the hospital is using the electronic medical record system, then you wouldn't be using this form manually, you would do it electronically. Use this form to assess others who fall or become unsteady during an admission. So that is pretty self-explanatory. And how to use the false and false risk assessment factor form. In Section A, this is Section A, it lists down the risk factors for falls. It says here in section A, indicate presence or absence of risk factor by circling yes or no. So when we go through section A, in this form, we will be going through some of the risk factors and if any of them apply to your patient, then you would circle yes or a no. And then you would sign and date the top of the column, which we will have a look later. Use recommended actions in table one, to plan action to manage and modify the risk factors identified. So this is table one. In here, it gives you recommended actions for consideration. So if you identified any risk factors, that is, if you circle yes to any of the questions in section A, then you would refer to table one for recommended actions to manage and modify the risk of fall or fall-related injury. Third point says record actions taken in the action column in section A. For begin fall and false injury risk review, if a risk factor marked with that black triangle is present and review each shift or weekly for a subacute. So if the patient is in hospital, you would review every shift. If the patient is in a subacute section, then you would only do it weekly. 
ensure safe ward and safe bedside environment is established for all patients. In Table 2, it gives you what constitutes safe ward and safe bedside environment, what you can do to provide a safe ward and a safe bedside environment for your patients to reduce the risk of falls. And use Section B to record actions taken in preparation for discharge, for example, for people at risk of falls or injuries. After discharge, then whatever preparation that you make to help the, keep the patient safe at home, you would list it in Section B. So coming to the next section, it is Table 2. Table 2 gives you a guide for environmental safety for all patients, both in the ward and the bedside. Provide aid to promote safe mobility or function. If your patient has reduced mobility, do they need a walking frame? Do they need a walking stick? You know, what sort of mobility aid does your patient need in order to promote their safe mobility? Next point is modify or remove tripping or slipping hazards. So at the start of your shift, you know, when you do your handover, you look around if there's any risk of tripping or slipping hazards. Like if there's a wet floor, you put up the caution sign or if there's a cable lying around, you make sure to remove it and you know take it away from the patient's environment because the patients can trip and it could result in falls. Arrange the ward or rooms to allow space more mobilizing. Always make sure that you're not cluttering the room too much because that's minimizing the space for your patient to mobilize or to walk around. Use visible system to notify all staff of falls risk. There are different ways to, that you can notify other staff of the false risk of the patient, that this patient is a high false risk. Some areas would use dots, like over the bedside, if there's four dots or four red dots, that means the patient is high risk of falls. Support equipment falls or breakdowns, this is very important. If you notice that an equipment is not working, put an out of order sign and then let your manager know so that it can be fixed straight away so that it doesn't have an impact on the patient care. Use brakes on mobile equipment, including beds and bedside lockers. This is a very important point to remember. Let's say that you've taken the patient to radiology for x-ray or the patient has come back from having some sort of procedure done back to the ward. Obviously, when the orderlies were pushing the patient around, they took the brake off. But when they dropped the patient off to the ward, they forgot to put it on and you forgot to check it. And then the patient tries to get out of bed and because there's no brakes on, they slip and fell out of bed. We don't want that to happen, so make sure you always check. Have clear, easily understood sign for patients, which is important. Have wayfinding night lighting or night sensor lights. Make changes in floor level or doorways with contrast stripes. So these are some of the things that you can do to provide a safe ward environment, some of which isn't really applicable to you as a staff member, but most of them are. So now let's have a look at safe bedside environment. So the first step in a safe bedside environment is orientate your patient to the environment and their relatives or their family members or carers who are present with them. Next point is have call bell, glasses, walking aid, drink, food, tissue within the patient's reach. The next point is leave the bed or chair at the correct height and after that is use bed rails only after assessment of harm versus the need for it. There is a bed rail decision making tool which you can use that will help you and determine whether your patient need to have the bed rails up or bed rails down. Ensure their clothing and bedding are not dragging on the floor. Use lighting, including night lights where appropriate, and eliminate glare with blind or curtains. These are really, really important. This information I'm telling you is gold. Guide for environmental safety for all patients, okay? Just try and memorize it. Because like I said, you would need these even after you pass OSCE and when you give your interview. So section B covers discharge actions completed. You know, what are the steps that you need to make sure that the patient is safe in the community after their discharge? So the GP notified, yes, no, not available. So you tick whichever is applicable. Equipment arranged for home use and specify. So let's say your patient has had come out of a hip surgery and they were able to uh, fully mobilize before hospitalization and now that because of the surgery, their mobility is decreased. For example, that they can't walk themselves anymore because of the surgery and they're going to need some mobility aid and there need to be some arrangement. Whatever mobility aid that they need, make sure that that's already arranged prior to discharge and is ready for use at home. 
Referral made to Community Force Prevention Service or other serv services, you specify it here. So here in Australia, there are a lot of community services that are available for the patient to access in the community to make sure that they are safe at home. So if your patient has had an uh, increased risk of fall or you know a history of fall, make sure to refer them to the Community Force Prevention Services or any other services which is appropriate. Patient given written information about force prevention services. Discuss false risk and plans with patient or carers. It's always very important to involve not the, only the patient but also their carers mm -hmm. because the carers are the one providing the care. They need to be aware of what are the plans that you have put in place to make sure that the patient is safe in the community. Next is hand over to residential aged care facility. So if your patient is from a residential aged care facility or also call a nursing home before they get discharged please always make sure that you call the nursing home first in advance so that the nursing home or the residential aged care facility can make the necessary arrangement and preparation for the patient to return back to the aged care facility. Coming to page two which covers the risk factors for falls initial assessment date and plan this is very important so this is the one that you would do when the patient first arrived into the ward within eight hours. So you put the date and the time, your full name, your signature and your designation, which should be an RN. Section A.1, false history. Does the patient have a history of falls? Now, was the patient admitted as a result of fall or they have had more than one fall in the previous six months? Then you would circle yes. If the patient didn't have any, then you say no. So all the risk factors related to falls or harm from falls are listed in Section A. Just for the sake of time, we won't go through them all uh, one by one. Just have a read through once you have a chance. In order to enable you to formulate a care plan to reduce falls and contribute to patient safety, this assessment needs to be done properly. Coming to the top of page two, up here, like I said, initial assessment and date. This is the first time you do the false assessment that's there. The second assessment, the third assessment and the fourth assessment. Okay. Now, if you circle yes to any of these, so let's go through the recommended actions if any, if you tick yes to any of these, okay? For example, let's say that your patient has had a fall at home or at the nursing home, that's why they're admitted to the hospital, then you would obviously tick yes. Then what is the recommended action here for 1A? You would go to page four and you would go here, 1A, medical assessment for loss of consciousness, syncope, blackout or seizure, physiotherapist assessment of mobility or gait. So you would make sure that there's a medical assessment for a loss of consciousness. Was the fall caused due to a syncopal episode or a blackout or a seizure? So the medical team will do a thorough assessment on the patient to find out the reason for the fall. And from your part as a registered nurse, you would refer the patient to a physiotherapist to have their mobility and gait assessment and uh, so that the physio can make a proper assessment and make recommendation on what level of mobility assistance uh, the patients need, okay, or mobility aid. One, does the patient had a fall or near miss during this current admission? So in this admission, let's say the patient was in ED before they came up to the ward and they already had had a fall or a near miss, then what's the action that you need to take? Come back to t page four, table one. And here, 1B, report incident to safety learning system. That is their reporting system in South Australia and ensure post fall management procedures and team review are completed. So if your patient has an inpatient fall, you would straight away report it to the reporting system. In New South Wales, we use IMS Incident Management System, but obviously in South Australia, they use the Safety Learning System. In Australia, in Australian healthcare system, all incidents such as falls or adverse events are captured and managed properly, and it is a very important aspect of patient safety reporting the incidences that occurred in the hospital that has an impact on the patient outcome or the quality of care. Section A.2, injury or harm. Is the patient at risk of injury or harm should a fall occur? So, you know, if you tick yes, let's say osteoporosis, the patient has a history of osteoporosis and diminished bone strength. If you tick yes, then what is the recommended actions that you're going to take? So then you would come up to page four again and look here to the corresponding number. Protective garments such as hip protector, Helmets, limb protector, stump protector, shock absorbing mats at bedside, 
For patients with increased risk of fall, there are so many aids that you can use to minimise the impact of the fall or, or the injury. It mentioned here caution and tripping hazard. Which is very important because if your patient is known to get out of bed in the middle of the night, but if you put a mat there, obviously that increases the, the trip hazard as well. So keep that in mind. You always need to weigh does the benefit outweighs the risk. And obviously, you know, if your patient has a diminished bone strength, consider bone health, DEXA scan, vitamin D testing, review osteoporosis medications, were they taking their medications regularly? Does the patient have a vitamin D supplement, particularly if the patient is of HK residence? In point 2B, it says if your patient have a frail skin or amputation stump, if you circle yes, what do you need to do? Assess skin integrity and provide protection, example, limb protectors and stump protectors. Low BMI, what can you do for low BMI? What's the action recommended if your patient has a low BMI? Let's have a look. Hip protector is if osteoporotic, low BMI, mobile but unsteady and agreeable. Screen for malnutrition. So MUST, M-U-S-D stands for Malnutrition Universal Screening Tool. MUST is a five-step screening tool that is used to identify patients or individuals who are malnourished. Investigate unintentional weight loss. Does your patient have eating disorder or is it unintentional? Investigate unintentional weight loss. Unintentional weight loss is when the patient's lost weight without trying to lose weight. It might be due to an underlying cause. So those are some of the examples of how you are going to use those forms. Um, according to the risk factors identified, what are the recommended actions that you would take? So just for the sake of time, because it is quite a lengthy form, uh, we wouldn't go through the, the whole risk factors. But if you have any questions, feel free to put it in the comment section below and I'll answer those for you. So there you go, guys. This is the false risk assessment form. Very important. Please go through this form and if you have any questions, please let me know. And just before I go, I want to give a quick shout out to Minu, who's preparing for OSCE. A quick shout out to Jasprit Kaur, Liz, also Nguyen Rothen from Cambodia and wanting to come over to Australia. Another shout out to Joy Jen. Thank you guys so much for all your comments and input. Thank you so much for taking the time to comment and watching those videos. And I hope these videos are helpful to you. Again, if you have any comments or questions, please put that down in the comment section below and again I will try and answer them to the best of my abilities. So thank you for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one. Take care and enjoy the process. Preparing for OSCE can be hard but try and enjoy the process as much as possible because these are the days that you will remember once you come to Australia and good luck. Thank you. Bye-bye.